<laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to the KPMG building. Uh, my name is Mike McKenzie. I'm with Cobalt, uh, and uh, it's my pleasure and honor to uh, to welcome you guys here. Um, we're we're really excited uh, about today's uh, lunch talk. Um, We'd also like to thank KPMG for hosting us uh, here in this uh, beautiful facility. Uh, so thank you to KPMG. Uh, today's talk is called Shift Left, Look Right. Uh, with two speakers today, Michael Argest uh, from uh, Cobalt, uh, our CEO and co-founder, and Farshad Abazi, uh, who's the uh, Chief Security Officer of Forward Security. Uh, just a little bit about Cobalt and Forward Security. Cobalt provides cybersecurity that empowers you to pursue innovation. We collect, analyze, monitor, and make recommendations based on events occurring uh, across your corporate, cloud, and SaaS line of business environments. And Forward Security provides world-class security service with a focus on all things code-related, helping you assess and monitor the security risk of your applications is their priority. Uh, we baseline your application and incorporate tools and processes to keep your apps and data secure. A little bit about our speakers today, uh, starting with Michael. Uh, over 20 years uh, in information security, uh, including operations, security sales, leadership, and consulting. Uh, he's worked at Sophos, TELUS, Sky Northern, and now Cobalt. Uh, he's well connected to local, the local and international community, and he's a member of the Vancouver ISACA, Provincial Security Advisory Committee, SecSig, and more. Uh, he's presented internationally in Moscow, Oxford, uh, New York, and uh, with the Associated Press. And there's his LinkedIn and Twitter handle. Next up, Farshad Abazi. He's based out of Vancouver and a UBC alum uh, in biology and computer science. Uh, he's the CSO and founder of Forward Security, an instructor at BCIT, a news correspondent for CFAX in Victoria, a board member for B-Sides Vancouver, chapter lead of o OWASP Vancouver, an avid music fan, and I don't think he has time for anything else in his life. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're, we're going to jump into uh, our, our talk today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Michael Argest from Cobalt. And, and that's why you hire a presenter. So you get the round of applause just to start. So the core theme today, um, shift left, look right, is really talking about how security is be best dealt with, frankly, in places we traditionally do not deal with it. Um, traditionally, how we deal with security is we um, have preventative technologies that stop attackers. We um, patch like crazy and hope that the vulnerabilities don't get pwned by the attackers. Um, and then when we get pwned, we usually don't notice until a third party notifies us and then we are dealt with the cleanup and the mess. And so today we're talking about how to reapply uh, security principles to deal with security earlier in the design cycle as well as um, look at the monitoring capabilities to get earlier in the response cycle to improve and reduce the overall security risks and costs. Uh, a couple little things uh, to tie in here. I'm a huge fan of uh, Tanya and the work that she has been doing to promote Shift Left. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to check out her blog, um, there are a constant stream of ideas and recommendations and steps that organizations can be taking to help reduce their cost. And um, you know, current estimates are, you know, if you can deal with a security uh, design or a bug in the design issue, it costs you a dollar. If you deal with it in the release issue, it costs you about ten thousand dollars, right? And so, obviously, the earlier in your process you can deal with things, uh, the better, and the much it's much more economical. Um, you know, uh, Farshad is really going to talk about kind of how you make that move with code, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about how you make that, that move with monitoring. Um, very similarly, um, from a detection perspective, right now, um, the latest stats that I have from Poneman and every, everyone else, the average time to detect a breach is 206 days. Um, that's like most of those detections, about 53%, are coming from a third party. So uh, credit card processors, uh, everybody else still typically getting uh, notified by uh, Visa and MasterCard. Uh, your, um, you know, the, the FBI still makes regular phone calls, but the kind of the worst case scenario for most organizations is being Krebs. How many of you are familiar with that particular uh, phrase? A couple of hands go up. 
Yeah, so Brian Krebs being one of the foremost security researchers, constantly trolling the dark web for signs of indicators of breach, calls up organizations, um, tells them they've been breached before their team internally usually knows, asks for a comment, writes up an article, uh, was recently um, called into an investor call after uh, the people at, uh, I think it was WePro, uh, refuted his, his write-up. And so um, from a breach perspective, the longer it takes you to detect an incident, the more it costs you. And, and the, it rises very rapidly in the early days, right? Um, you, most organizations, unfortunately, have not invested in detection capabilities. And so as a result, um, that's why we're often dependent on third parties to, uh, to, to accomplish that. So with that being kind of the theme being set, I'm going to pass it over to Farshad to talk about shift left. You can clip that now. Thanks, Michael. Keep that on record. There we go. It does say record. Yes. It's a good thing. Uh, thanks, Michael. And uh, let's continue the conversation. I'm not going to spend too much time on the on these uh, on the topic Michael already mentioned, but uh, it's, it is important as you can see here. Majority of the issues uh, that were found were due to uh, you know not having not very good requirements. And as you go later, 27% during design, 7% during code, and 10% in other. Um, it's it's funny. I, while I was working at HSBC, we introduced a program around it was around 11 years ago, and we the whole idea was to work with the development teams and get them to come to us as soon as uh, they kick off the requirements phase. And it was really difficult to do that. They didn't see the value. They would come up and it was like, hey, we're, here's where we're a security team. We're here for you. Come to us as soon as the project is started. Let's talk about what kind of requirements you're going to have rather than go build it and come to us later. But they were really used to the traditional model where um, you know, they would come to the security team after it's built. They're like, okay, we'll test this. And then we would say, well, guess what? You know, your, your requirements, you're sending the customer's pin using SMS. Like That is nothing I can test. For, me, for you to go fix it, you have to go change your whole architecture, requirements, design, maybe send it through a different channel. That, cha that fundamental change is going to cost you a lot more. And if, and if you had come to us earlier, we'd been like, hey, maybe it's not a good idea to send the pin over SMS. Let's consider doing it some other way, or let's put some other uh, design uh, controls around it. But um, you know, essentially, that message, eventually, after about five or six years of that program running, they started, some teams became uh, security conscious. And then they would come to me right away. They're like, hey, we're starting a new project. Come to us, because they saw the value. But there were still teams around the, uh, around the group that uh, weren't doing that. But I think it's changing. I think more and more people are becoming aware aware of trying to, uh, it's important to, doing, uh, to do things earlier. And you can see here, again, it's got the design, implementation, testing, and maintenance phase. It's about 100 times more expensive to try to address that. So with all that said, let's look at what kind of things you can do. So um, you got to make security easier for the development teams. And what does that really mean? Um, you know, it, you should just adopt a people-centric uh, model in security. And that's not just with application security. It's with anything else, right? Even you, you look at end, endpoint uh, detection. We install all kinds of software on people's systems. And we install all kinds of firewalls and everything in our network. But all it takes is one person that doesn't know how to do things. They'll go and click on the wrong thing or open the wrong attachment and just blow the whole thing up, right? So that education and that awareness and focusing on people is not just uh, in application security. It's across everywhere, uh, every, every aspect of security. So when it comes to application security, um, the develop, you should start with security, security development and training. And that's one of the first things, you know, back in 2008 when I went to HSBC to launch this, uh, we had lunch and learns, right? We would go to, we had about a thousand different teams across the group. We would just go to them and say, hey, you, your team, you guys are going to attend a lunch and learn. There's going to be free pizza and pop. And that was, they would come for that and then be like, hey, we're going to teach you a few things, uh, what you can do, some quick, uh, you know, uh, quick, uh, quick uh, le lessons that you could take away and then do security better when you are developing your software. And that was really successful. And, and also empowering them to take personal responsibility for security, right? It's not like in the old days, I remember when my manager, when I started working there, he was like, hey, everyone thinks we're a cop and they would just run away from us. And you know, we, I want to change that model. I want them to come to us and I want it to be a partnership model. And I don't want this to be that the security team punishes the development team and, oh, you had all these things and this is bad and you should do all this stuff. It should be like, let's enable them. Let's empower them so that they're doing a lot of good, they're thinking about security, that, that they, uh, by, by thinking about it while they're building the software, uh, it makes things for everyone easier. And then we become more of a support to them instead of a police that is punishing them, right? So we, would, we started empowering them by doing presentations for them, teaching them about things, basic things like OWASP top 10, you know, making sure that they understand it. Once they, a lot of them, when they saw that kind of stuff, they'd be like, hey, this is great. Now I know what SQL injection is or cross-site scripting, right? I've been a developer. I didn't know half of that kind of stuff. When you're a developer, you're busy. You got a lot of functional things you got to build. You know, there's a list of requirements and you, that's all you got time for. And oftentimes you may not have time to go and think about those types of security issues. But if someone comes and says, hey, here's a, you know, let's 
let's do a lunch and learn and I'm going to teach you a few uh, easy things. Next time you're developing something, you're going to keep that in mind. So that's really important. And also there's other things you can do like um, teaching them how to do threat modeling, right? A lot of, uh, again, when, when people are designing software or building it, they model the use cases. So they go through all the requirements and they create use cases or user stories. And then for each of those user stories, they'll design the function. Well, what if you actually got the developers when they're coming up with a user story to also think about the evil story, right? Like, okay, well, the normal user is going to click on the button and move the money. Well, what would the evil user do? The evil user might actually try to put some other numbers in there and see if they can move more money than they should, right? So if, if the developers are thinking that way and doing quick threat modeling every time they're uh, you know, developing their user stories, they've caught a lot of the issues in design right there up front, right? But most developers don't even know what threat modeling is. So we started doing those kinds of things to, to train them and to get them to do threat modeling early, to think of those security issues. And then when they would come to us for a review, then our job would be less, to, then, we can, you know, then we really focus on the more challenging problems and things that aren't the low hanging fruit that where they really actually need a subject matter expert to, to help them with. And then the other thing is using frameworks and tools to handle security, right? We noticed so many times that um, every development team was building their own uh, ways to you know, prevent cross-site request forgery or SQL injection and input validations. Like, why is this being done with each team? The, the company should have central tools that are available uh, that, that facilitate that, right? Like, there should be a library of, hey, if you're tr building this kind of application, we have a library or the framework handles input validation for you instead of each development team and going and building that, right? Um, or security policies. You know, if... if um, there are ways to authorize or authenticate and check things instead of each development team within the company going and trying to build uh, components that perform those things. Again, uh, the, the, those should be provided centrally through either tools that the company develops and provides to the developer or frameworks that are available out there, um, including you know, things that you can put into the uh, IDEs or uh, into the, uh, you know, if, depending on what our architecture you're using into your gateway and other areas. Um, so, DevOps and injecting security into SDLC, right? De so DevSecOps. That's an interesting thing. I mean, it, there's so much confusion about even what DevOps means to begin with. Uh, to me, based on all the reading I've done, uh, f I finally kind of figured it out, right? I mean, it's, it's actually not that difficult. DevOps is not a methodology. It's sort of more of a, about how you bring things together, right? Really simple. You have the dev, dev team and you have the ops team, right? Most big companies that I've worked at, you probably have worked at, the dev team sat there and they built the software. And when they went to roll it out, they didn't even know how to install a database or where it goes. or They didn't care, right? My first job was at AMB Sound. I built uh, you know, web applications for them. But it was a small company. So I installed the database. I installed the server. I wrote the code. You know, I had a couple guys working for me. We were a little DevOps. Team. That's not what they called it back in 1997 or whatever, but that's exactly what we were doing. Then I went to Motorola and then I'm like, okay, now I'm a software engineer. And I was like, oh, cool, I'm going to write the code. Do I get to install it and you know, install the database and do all that stuff like I did in my other job? They're like, no, 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 no. We have an ops team that does that. You just compile the code, they'll take it and it goes somewhere magically and it gets deployed. To me, that was really weird having come from the small company. But now that you look at it, everyone is moving towards that model. It's been proven that, hey, that model actually, having everyone that is, uh, that is building something being also involved in the deployment is a good thing. So now this, you're removing the walls and you're bringing the dev and the ops teams together. But what about the security team, right? So in most large organizations, that's also a separate team. So you would have the development team build it. They would throw it at the ops team. They would install it. And then the security team would come in and spend a whole bunch of time and try to check that all out, right? Three separate walls, three separate teams. But if you bring all that stuff, you're like, hey, I'm going to have a small team of five. There's going to be a security representative, some ops representative, and a bunch of developers. This is my DevSecOps. Now, the problem with that is, and I've been in, in a DevSecOps team, again, at HSBC. We tried all this stuff 10 years ago. The problem with that is that you throw a security guy in there, he doesn't have enough work to do because a dev DevOps team, they're building. Most of 80% of their work on a day-to-day -day basis when they get together in a daily scrums or whatever they're doing is focused on development. Not, and then so as a security person that was assigned full-time to one of these teams, I was like, there's not enough for me to do. The, and then we found a fine balance where one security person would be a member of, let's say, three or four DevSecOps teams. That was a better use, utilization of that security person's time. So you know, we would meet with team X for one day and another for, with another team another day and so on and so forth. So each consultant would essentially handle three, uh, dev, be a member of three of those teams. And that worked out pretty well. So removing the barriers is a good thing. Security requirements must be clearly communicated and easily integrated into the complete process, right? And, and security review and testing must be integrated with multiple points in the DevOps workflow. You don't want to, again, wait until everything is done at the end and then come and like present a whole bunch of security issues to the developers. The whole point of bringing development and operations together is to be agile, right? To follow the agile model. So you build a little bit and then you release a little bit, right? And then if you're doing agile uh, uh, de deployment and, and following that model, well, you should also be that 
that way with your security. So every release or every uh, couple of sprints, you're performing uh, a small test and then you're releasing that instead of waiting till the end of the project and then performing a heavy test. Now, Automation is what something is going to really help with that, right? Because if you're trying to do manual reviews in depth for every couple of sprints, you may not have the resources, it may not make sense. So what you do in, the, in this model is you do a lot of things through automation and that, that's going to address 80% of your problems, essentially. So in, incorporating continuous security in a CI CD environment, what security tools should be integrated into the CI CD pipeline, right? So if you don't do that, then essentially what you're doing is, yeah, you have you know, a typical development uh, environment, you know, you'll have your uh, various gates on your pull requests, right? Your developers submit some code, uh, you know, there's a pull request, and then there's usually a, a gate which is, hey, let's make sure we do a code review. Those are the kinds of traditional things that people have been done, doing. Well, why not add a, another gate, uh, another check in that process for every pull request to do a, a security source analysis, right? Or dependency checking, or things that aren't going to take too long, but they add a lot of value. And integration allows low-hanging fruit to be caught earlier and regularly, right? So um, if, you, if you're doing this, let's say for every pull request, you run a security code scan, and then you also do a bunch of dependency checking, you've looked at uh, some of those problems earlier on. And maybe for your nightly builds, you run the dynamic scan, right? Then you can profile your application and have a dynamic scanner that captures um, you, or, or uh, discovers the OWASP top 10 issues, which are about 80% of the problems out there. So now, by the time you're having your release, you've caught 80% of the issues through dynamic testing and security scanning and dependency checking. And then when the security team comes, and, and, and what I say that is, we still need the security team, right? So this stuff is not going to get rid of the security team, but the security team focuses on that 20%, on the more difficult problems, on things that the, um, you know, the, 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 the application or the developers or the ops teams aren't security people. Um, and that they, don't, they may not uh, know as well. And you can't expect them to become full-fledged security people, right? Each of those fields, even development, is a, uh, is a field that requires someone to spend a lot of time and get really good at. You can't have a person that's going to be a, the best at all those different things. So by no means this removes the need to have a security team, but it makes uh, it, makes it less, uh, 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 there's less reliance on the security team, and they, the resources can be focused on where it matters. Um, and information security platforms should expose functionality via APIs. So if you're using some tools, that um, you plan on incorporating into your uh, you know, CI CD pipeline, um, ideally those tools would have some APIs that you're able to um, automate and then call the tool and be able to get some results and, and seamlessly integrate to your environment. Um, so yeah, the key thing is to maintain a security focus without slowing down delivery, right? So you need to add security to DevOps uh, agile speeds uh, to, 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 uh, to speed up the process. And you should add, do as much security through automation as possible, right? You don't want to uh, just maybe just do source code scanning. There are five different areas that in, in, you can address in automation. You should do source code scanning, checking for vulnerable uh, dependencies or packages that you're including in your system, doing some dynamic scanning, you know, like standing up the application and firing some stuff at it, like I said, trying to profile the OWASP top 10 issues, doing some uh, port scanning on, so, you know, are there ports open in that particular environment that shouldn't be, or looking at uh, TLS ciphers, SSL ciphers that aren't supported and shouldn't be there. Um, but the idea is uh, to do as much of it as possible and do it transparently and not really, uh, 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 you must preserve the agility and speed of the whole DevOps uh, uh, team essentially the whole, I mean the whole point that these guys got together and made a DevOps team and made it agile was to go fast right so if you're now saying oh no we're gonna do this uh, you know the old-school way of doing security and pause for a month and do all this test before you can go forward that's against uh, the, the model uh, of, 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 of agile uh, development so you want to maintain that agility while you're adding security and the best way to do that is through automation so shift left security increases delivery speed by reducing the number of eyeballs and, and resulting in smaller efficient teams and uh, you get uh, uh, total gates with manual uh, manual checks. What about immutable infrastructure and impact on security? This is just uh, this is actually really interesting because once you go to, uh, to automation and everything you know uh, is is automated and you have playbooks to roll things out, why would you still have uh, mutable infrastructure? And the difference between mutable and immutable, for those of you who may not be familiar, is that mutable infrastructure is stuff that you install the server and then you keep it up for a year, two years, five years, and you install things on it, you patch it, you never destroy it, right? You just um, in, in Amazon they call them pets and cattles. Right? Pets are things that you, it's a cat, you, you have one of them, you grow it, it stays with you for 10 years, and it's, still, it's the one thing, right? Cattle are disposable, you got a whole bunch of them, if you lose one, it doesn't matter, right? 
and that's the whole idea with uh, with uh, using Im moving towards immutable infrastructure is that mutable structure. You know, you got an admin goes into SSH into the server, um, upgrades packages, they adjust configuration, they push patch it, patches via an agent. That patch management becomes a nightmare because now if you've got a thousand workloads, they got to go to all those thousand workloads and patch them and all that kind of stuff, right? With immutable infrastructure, components are replaceable, replaced that rather than changed, right? So what you do is you have a process, you have a playbook. What this is what my um, you know uh, web server looks like. It's got nginx and it's got Tomcat and it's got this version of Red Hat Linux with these patches. You have a playbook that automatically can generate that through automation. And then every maybe once every once a week, you just blow all your machines and just roll out new ones, right? That way, if someone has compromised one of your machines, they've installed some malware on them or whatever, it doesn't matter because every few days or few hours or whatever, you're going to wipe all those machines and then put new ones so they can't just go in there and oftentimes you, you hear about these attack uh, th uh, attacks that oh someone had uh, compromised the company they were in there for six months and the company didn't even know about it right if you're following this model they can't last in there for six months because you're going to wipe everything and deploy new machines but your architecture has to change and you have to uh, you can't have any data or anything that you depend on on those on those systems so immutability uh, results in increased security because patching updating large number of servers is not required um, because you can create an image and then push that very, very quickly. And existing applications need to be re-architected to, to follow this model. Uh, what about security code and production? Uh, this you, uh, re requires uh, manual approval in the pipeline. Um, to put sensitive components from dev into production, right? Because so you do have to have a gate at, that's, that at some point to say, has this gone through all the automation? Have all the issues been addressed before you can push it into production? Particularly with things that handle sensitive data or functionality. And you should try to use automated installers and uninstallers. You should deploy, uh, you should use at least privileged security model, right? That hopefully is obvious, but you shouldn't install your um, your services that with, uh, with, uh, with root privileges. You should try to minimize the privilege that all your services have um, as they're built and deployed and you should apply change control that's really important and configuration management so you capture the baseline configuration to identify malicious changes and and ability to track changes is useful from a security perspective because you can go back and see who did what and why did they do it is this something that should have been done um, and, and perform that audit and you can perform uh, you can prevent unauthorized changes and roll back uh, those that maybe uh, they may have introduced some security issues or vulnerabilities so um, this, so, so far, what we've talked about a lot of different concepts, uh, but my company, Forward Security, we've created a product, uh, and uh, Glenn, our developer, is here as well. Uh, this can help automate some of your uh, CI CD uh, requirements. And this is an open source tool. We're probably going to release it in, a, in the next little while. But essentially, we looked at, uh, you know, the, the one aspect of this was the automation. And one of the challenges is that when, uh, as an organization, when you try to go do this, you're like, okay, well, I want to automate security. What do I, where do I start? It's like, well, there's five different concerns to address. And then for each of those concerns, there are hundreds of tools. And then you have to install those tools everywhere. And it becomes a big complex uh, uh, a problem that you have to deal with. So here you can see there's two different types of concerns. There's application security testing coverage and environment security testing coverage. Within application security, you have to do static code analysis, dependency checking, dynamic application scanning. So our uh, Eureka by default comes with you know, a bunch of open source packages. So for static code analysis, we're including the uh, spot bugs or the fine security bugs. Uh, and then we also support Veracode or, or, or Breakman. Um, dependency checking, we include the OWASP dependency check, bundle audit, NSP. Uh, we also support merge base, which uh, a couple of people from them are here as well. Hi, <laughs> Julius. Uh, a dynamic application scanning. So currently, we're supporting uh, OWASP Zap. We're also uh, planning on integrating Burp Pro. And again, this is an extensible environment. So all uh, additional pack tools for addressing these different concerns can be added as well. And for environment security, we, uh, there's two different aspects, infrastructure scanning and TLS as, uh, analysis. So uh, we include OpenVOS, which is open source, and we also support Nessus. And for TLS scanning, uh, we're planning on using uh, SSLIs. So again, um, you know, it makes things a lot easier. So it's a single, uh, easy to deploy package. It's a Docker container. You don't need to install multiple uh, scanners or deal with conflict uh, between, oh yeah, this scanner needs this version of Java, that needs this other version of Java. It becomes a nightmare pretty quickly. So we alleviate all that stuff. And it's an easy, centralized way to update the scanner, right? You don't have to go and update, you know, five or six different tools that you've installed. You just have a, uh, you know, our Docker image, which uh, we maintain and we, we update. 
And uh, we, so this handles the orchestration of security scanners, right? Also, if you install your own packages, you have to figure out what to launch and when and orchestrate all the stuff. Uh, we use a framework, it's called Salus, it's an open source uh, framework. We've uh, extended it to support the different scanners that can be activated based on the language framework and, and various other configuration means. And um, there, you know, as I said earlier, it is, uh, this tool is extens extensible, so you can have different scanners and tools that can be added on um, as, as required. Um, what about reporting? It can uh, generate single aggregated report as well as individual reports from each scanner. Uh, formats that we're uh, supporting are X XML and HTML, and it will also uh, support JSON in some cases. It can integrate with issue tracking systems like Jira and, 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 and U-Track and things like that. I mean, XML documents are available as well. And, and we're planning as a future roadmap to uh, create a control center where you can have a dashboard where you could configure different scanners and, and be able to have a central access to the reporting uh, a me a mechanism. Here's a quick slide on the architecture. So you can see here, here's the host operating system. And then typically you'll have something like Team City that does the, the CI CD or the builds. And then you'll have something for tracking like Jira. So we give you a container here. And there's our orchestration layer. And you've got the different scanners, right? Static code analysis, dependency checking, dynamic app scanning, infrastructure scanning, and TLS scanning. And depending on where in your build, like for example, if you just want to do the code scanning, this thing, uh, the Eureka can, can start up and run these two agents on your, on your code repo or the dynamic agent can start and then running on an instance of the app. Or if you wanted to check your pre-production or production environments, the, uh, the infrastructure scanners can go and do their job um, as, as programmed. And then here you can see the future roadmap. That'll be the console that uh, we would uh, provide a central view and, and configuration management. So uh, also our partner Cobalt that's uh, in the room. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. For thank you, Michael, for organizing this event. Um, we're uh, what we're doing is so what, while Cobalt makes a system that gives you a central view of the security of your operation of, or the organization, uh, we are looking at the security issues that are introduced through the development pipeline. So by through this partnership, we give you a single view where you can not only see your um, you know any security issues with your endpoints or with your servers in operation, you can also see any issues that are introduced as a result of your development pipeline. So, um, you know, like all the all the different tools that we incorporate, they produce reports, and then that would be available centrally. So, single view of your security, which is really nice from an organization perspective. So, you could plug your Eureka into Cobalt Security Monitoring Service and get a single view. And you can add application security into in your incident response, right? So, while uh, the Cobalt product will notify you if there's an incident within your environment, now by having this plugin, they can also notify you if an incident would result as a vulnerable package in your product, for example, or some other security vulnerability that was re really introduced through your software. And it gives you uh, central control um, as well. So I think that is time to right. talk about looking right. Excellent. Farsh, I can take a breath now? Yes. <laughs> I think I did it in time. Right? I think you did in one breath as well. So. There we go. <laughs> um, so this is my third presentation in two days. So if I seem a little bit slow and uh, fuzzy around the uh, edges, that's why. Um, I was just in Victoria yesterday giving a talk on cloud security and talking to a bunch of students on, on cyber, careers in cybersecurity, something I'm very passionate about is getting students involved. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to partner with Farshed and what they're doing with uh, forward security is that fundamentally I believe that, I mean, today infrastructure is code, right? So if you think about traditional organizations, it's not data centers and servers and firewalls and laptops that people care about anymore. It's their code base and what's in the cloud and what's in their SaaS services. So uh, out of curiosity, just show of hands, how many people here are actively involved in writing code inside their organization? Quarter, all right, great. Um, how many of you have some sort of operational responsibility? All right, looking at blinky lights, that kind of stuff. Um, and so one of the questions, we're very focused on small and mid-market sized organizations rather than traditional large enterprise. Um, and there's a bunch of reasons behind that. And the core reason is, I believe it's a fundamentally underserved market, right? So if you're, how many of you work for an organization with less than 100 employees, all right? So if you're in an organization with less than 100 employees, you probably have one person who does security off the side of their desk, right? Um, and it's like maybe 10 or 20% of their time, if you're lucky. If you're, uh, if you're really lucky, you might have one person dedicated to it full time. And so the real question is like, who watches all the blinky lights, right? Like at the end of the day, um, you know, I've got my servers that are sending me alert messages. I got my firewalls telling me things. I got my endpoint stuff telling me things. A lot of it is signal and not a lot of it is, a lot of it is noise and not a lot of it is signal. And so being able to actually put together a cohesive picture of what's going across an entire organization is difficult 
in a traditional infrastructure where it's a data center and a firewall and an endpoint, but in an organization where it's you know, my AWS cloud environment talking to my GitHub repository, talking to a developer's laptop with code integrations through Slack and Jira and all these other services, um, it's much, much more difficult to build a cohesive view across that environment. And so that's when we talk to, to, to our target customers today, um, you know, they live in this kind of world. They live in a world where, you know, frankly, um, you know, if, if they had to move offices tomorrow, they would pick up their laptops and 15 minutes later they would be functional in a new location because all of their stuff that they care about is in the cloud. If uh, most of the, the people I talk to, their developers don't even run antivirus, right? Which from an old school security perspective is like scary as hell, right? But um, you know, there's just this belief that I don't really care about this, I care about my AWS environment. Right? I care about the production environment out there. That's where my data is that, that I'm concerned about. Um, but in a multi-homed environment where I've got cloud infrastructure and SaaS applications and the developer laptops and all that kind of stuff, the threat actors have figured this out as well. And so a classic story um, that I ran into with one of, the, one of our target customers the other day was they had um, really locked down the production AWS environment. They were following a lot of the shift left activities. You know, they had everything patched. They had, they had written a fairly secure application by design. The attackers were trying the front door. They had turned on the recaptcha and all their passwords were in Argon2 storage and all this kind of fun stuff. And then the attackers figured this out. And so what did they do? They targeted the developer. Right? They went after the developer's laptop, compromised the developer's laptop, got a uh, backdoor pushed into the code repository in GitHub, and then pushed into production. It lived in production for two years without them being able to detect it. Because like, what in their, in their workflow was going to detect that? Nothing. They had individual blinky lights telling them things, but they, they didn't know how to put together a whole picture. Um, and then once it was in production, like it was in production. It was just legitimate production code. And so they had no way of kind of detecting it after the fact. So organizations typically seek to solve this problem in a number of different fashions. And most organizations, frankly, are doing the first step. Ignore the blinky lights, right? Like, yeah, it's just another alert. I don't really need to pay attention to that. Or I'm going to ignore 80% of them because I only have three hours in a day um, to work on security off the side of my desk. And so I'm going to deal with the things that I think are most important. I'm going to ignore the other ones, right? Um, another step is buy a tech and hope it solves a problem, which is great if you have the team to run the tech, right? But if you don't have the person to run the technology, you know, having a Splunk or an ArcSight or a Logarithm or any one of these big technologies that does all this integration for you doesn't really get you anywhere because nobody's operating it at the end of the day. So then we go, all right, I'm going to hire a person by a tech and work to solve the problem, right? So this is typically when organizations get to be about two or 300 employees, they start to take this journey of, I'm going to invest in this. I'm going to actually uh, spend the time. And the last one is kind of, I'm going to outsource this to a large MSSP, like a Telus or a Bell or somebody else. And they're going to you know, have this big platform, big technology, and they're going to charge me a million dollars. And then you know, maybe I'll get something at the end of the day. And I know this because I used to sell that stuff. And it was a long and painful journey for most customers. And so um, the typical customer journey for this is, um, I don't have a security person, right? So I got I to gotta post a job, hire a person, onboard that person, three, four, five, six months later, depending on how good I am at hiring. I'm going to select and deploy technology. I might try to do this first. I might go, I'm going to hire the person while I'm selecting the technology. And then I've, I've, I've winnowed my pool of candidates to people who know that technology, or I have to train them once they're on board. So it doesn't really save me any time. And then I'm going to onboard my data sources. And then I'm going to start building use cases. And later on to the right, I'm going to do things like integrate threat intelligence and all this kind of stuff. And so you know, 12 months later, I spent a quarter of a million dollars on staffing and onboarding and hiring and, and technology, and I'm just starting to turn the curve on getting value out of all the data sources within my environment. And so our approach is different. Our approach is kind of agile, right? So what we do is we have a cloud-based multi-tenant analytics platform. So instead of you having to build a thing, you just send us data, right? Um, we combine data and monitoring at scale. So if you're a large organization, you can build this platform yourself, but if you're a small organization and you can't afford to, the fact that we can see a whole bunch of customers and build use cases across a whole bunch of customers allows us to lower the cost per customer and provide benefit to each customer without having to ramp up the cost. We have a SOC team that uh, builds these use cases as proactive hunting and provides recommendations. One of the biggest challenges for most operators inside a security environment is, you know, this alert has told me a thing, now what? Right? So I got this alert off my firewall. What do I do with it? What's the, if I'm 
Somebody who's doing security off the side of my desk, 10 to 20% of my time, I probably haven't seen this particular alert in six months. So what, what, like, so then you spend two days trying to figure out how to resolve the issue, right? So that's where recommendations, both reactive and proactive, can make a big difference. One of the other things that we try to do with our customers is say, you know, you're probably not going to see a serious security incident in every week. You're going to see something every maybe six to nine months. But in between those security incidents, there are steps you can be taking to improve your security. There are individual proactive steps that you can be taking to move your security stance up and to the right over time. Um, and the other thing that I'm really, really passionate about is, you know, really thinking about kind of the modern world, which is not data centers and servers and firewalls, but it's about cloud and SaaS applications and understanding that this is the, this is the platform that most organizations are built on today. And so we have to be able to cover all those different things. And frankly, one of the things that we do that's really powerful is actually just using open source intelligence, OSINT, to actually get a passive perspective of the customer's organization before they've even onboarded any data with us at all. So we can start telling them where their weaknesses are before they sent us one bit of data. So the journey with us compared to you know, a traditional uh, a SIM type implementation is we provide a little bit of OSINT, we onboard two or three sources, right? That is typically like deploy a container, at least similar to Farshad's model, or you know, use our OAuth workflow to integrate G Suite or something like that, right? So we onboard a few sources and we can start seeing and providing recommendations to the customer right away. So instead of 12 months before you start to turn that curve, right, we're doing it in days, right? So within days, we're giving you proactive advice on how to improve your security stance and, and make those steps forward. So the idea is after 12 months, not only have you spent a lot less money because we're charging you a lot less than a full-time employee would cost you, but we're also substantially moving your security stance forward. And so that's a, that's a big thing for us. Um, so kind of a couple of things in closing. So where's the data? What do we care about? In the traditional world, it's servers, data centers, laptops, networks. And today, um, how many would you say this is, the, this is where the data is that you care about in your environment, right? It's your cloud production environment. It's your SaaS applications. It's your code repositories your third party's integrations. I had a great conversation with uh, a CISO in town the other day, and, sh and she was telling me, you know, yes, I'm worried about my AWS environment. Yes, I'm worried about my GitHub code repository. But I've also got like 27 different plugins into my Slack, right? And my data is all over the place, and I have no idea where it is, and how do I keep track of that? And so these integrations are becoming a big thing. But at the end of the day, it's really about users and user behavior, right? Um, so. You know, users exist in both environments, and users are usually your first line of defense and also the, the, the thing that the attackers will go after if your systems are hard. And so being able to monitor user activity across all of these different things really helps you build a comprehensive viewpoint of what's going on inside your organization. So before, I gave you the example of, you know, developer's laptop was compromised, code was pu pushed into, into production. Um, you know, if you can actually attribute back to an individual user, individual behavior and activity, then that helps you reduce the risk of that kind of um, attack being successful. I'm taking a breath now, because Farshad didn't. <laughs> so, I mean, out of curiosity, how many of you would say your critical assets that you care about inside your organization live um, primarily in a production cloud environment? Right, so AWS, show of hands, Azure, one Azure, GCP, no, no GCP? Okay. <laughs> Except for we do a little bit of GCP at Cobalt. Um, and like S3 buckets, uh, RDS databases, that kind of stuff. Like these are, this is where the data that we care about is being stored, right? And so one of the traditional, one of the problems is you go out and you post that job and you hire the person. And like a lot of them are old school security people like me, right? Like IP, sports, protocols, we get. But when you start talking about code and repositories and APIs and microservices, our heads start to swim, right? And so you know, that's a, a big shift and challenge that we have to go through as an organization, uh, as an industry altogether, is actually recognizing that you know, these assets, are, they exist in the cloud, they exist as code. You know, we need to understand how they're knit together and how we protect them. Um, what security risks are you most concerned with? Anybody have an answer to that? Developers. Your developers, yeah. So, can you can you elaborate on that a little bit? The so for us, we are a hundred percent Docker on AWS microservices. We blow them away once a month. Yep. Similar to what Farshad was saying earlier. Um, I've always 
believe that the biggest risk to your orientation or people like me who have the keys to everything about mm -hmm. So, like, applying for that. Yeah. And like often, the people who have the most powerful keys are also the ones who refuse to run security on their laptops and stuff like that, right? It's like, you know, and they're they're doing silly things like checking code into their public repositories with the keys and stuff like that. Hopefully, that's not a problem in your <laughs> environment, um, but that happens all the day, time, right? Um, during my cloud talk yesterday, I was talking a lot about, like, in the past, you might have sort of gotten away with security through obscurity in terms of like if you made that key mistake of checking into the public repository, nobody would see it. There are so many automated scrapers out there these days that look for people with public S3 buckets or with keys and code and all this kind of stuff that if you've done it, somebody's going to find it, right? So you can't count on that obscurity anymore. Um, any other security risks people want to talk about? Users, really. Users? Just their, their recognition of the challenge and decision makers' recognition of the need to invest to solve that challenge. Right. So users just frankly don't really care about security that much or they just don't, it's not a priority for them? They don't see it as part of their role, as part of their responsibility. Nobody ever made it visible to them that it was a thing. Yeah. Yeah, there's a definite opportunity in security culture to make it so that everybody recognizes it's part of their job, right? Um, and, you know, I'm a big fan of leveraging the user as an opportunity to improve the security stance of their organization. And a very simple example of this is, I mean, if you log into your G Suite from a new computer, Google tells you, right? Hey, I saw a login from a new computer. And nine times out of 10, that's a perfectly legitimate login, no big deal. But the 10th time, you've now given the user a, a, an ability to report back that there's an issue, right? So leveraging the users as an asset and engaging them in that kind of security conversation is a really powerful tool. They are your first and last line of defense at the end of the day, right? They're the ones that are likely to introduce weakness because the developers are doing crazy things with keys. But they're also the ones that can, you know, help be early detectors when things are going wrong. This is something that I don't expect. This is something unusual. Um, any other security risks people want to talk about? I think a combination of plugins. Like yeah. Each plugin is secure, but right. two different plugins, and there is some least happen because of that. Yeah, I'm a big fan of like Amazon. Everybody familiar with Amazon's shared responsibility model with security? It's a good kind of uh, guideline for if you're doing security in the cloud. Uh, if you visit AWS's website, you'll see it. Um, and it says, like, they're responsible for the hypervisor and everything down, right? So data center, redundancy, and all this kind of stuff. And you're responsible for everything up, right? So all your application data and all your credentials and everything else, um, which makes a lot of sense when you're just buying EC2 and S, you know, S3 buckets and stuff like this. But then, you know, typically you're taking all that stuff and then you're combining it with a bunch of different Docker containers. You're combining it with, you know, maybe a Heroku, you know, combining it with all these different services. You've got, now you've got, like, 12, 15 different service providers all integrated, and where's your point of view against who owns what and what's going on? And so that's a, the, the plugins and the integrations are, I, I think it's a, a challenge the industry has yet to really come to wrestle with. Um, I think one, two things that I hear quite often is, number one is actually, I'm not so much concerned about compromise as I am concerned about availability. Right, and if you live in a DevOps world, I mean, you live this every day, right? Like, if you take, if you make the wrong security choice, it isn't necessarily that somebody's going to breach your environment, but you're going to take your environment down, and that production cloud environment is what's serving your users, and so that's a big risk. Um, and then the other risk that we don't really talk about so much in the security community, but is the thing that's driving a lot of our customers to engage, is the risk to the business and the risk to be able to continue to secure business, right? So. We focus a lot on uh, technology companies and companies like B2B SaaS companies. And for them, you know, say you're a B2B SaaS company, you go out and you land Starbucks, right? And you go, great, I've got this great new account. And they come to you, they go, great, the last thing we need to do to, before we finalize this contract is we need to go over your security program. And here's a 40-page questionnaire. How many of you have seen something like that? Yeah. Right? And so you're looking at this questionnaire, and you've got one person doing security off the side of their desk. And you're hoping you can somehow get through all this. And so, you know, one of the security risks that I'm really passionate about is the security risk to the business in terms of being able to continue to innovate and secure new deals, right? Um, I'm a big believer that small organizations bring a tremendous amount of innovation to industry overall. But in order for them to be successful, they need to be able to overcome that security risk. Um, and that's kind of part of our whole mission. Um, so how many of you, out of curiosity, within your organization have one or less security resource on your team? Most? 
Yeah. Does zero count? Does zero count? Zero counts. Yes, or less. Zero is definitely under the less, right? Um, yeah. So this conversation usually leads to you know it's Joe. Um, Joe has or Sally. You know they have ten to twenty percent of their time to look at the blinky lights. I trust that they're doing the monitoring, but in reality, I want to free up that time. And so our our kind of whole thing here is, if I can give you targeted advice and recommendations on things that we see in your environment with things that you can be doing to proactively improve your security stance, then that 10 to 20% of your time isn't going around playing whack-a-mole with blinky lights. It's actually moving your security program forward. And then lastly, um, do you know what an external view of risks and attackers look like? Right? Do you know like what if, a, if somebody is just doing a very passive look at your environment, what are they going to see? Um, and especially in any environment that's been around for more than a few years, um, this is an area where um, you know organizations um, could really benefit because they have all this legacy infrastructure, and it's amazing how much information I can get out of, you know, looking at your subdomains, looking at hosts, all this kind of stuff, without ever even touching your environment and finding vulnerable services and and, and, and mapping that without ever having to like actually try to do an active pen test or anything like that. So one of the things that we focus on here is looking for those old and exposed systems and config, uh, improperly configured hosts. One of the things I love about the new cloud environment is all the exposed systems, traditionally, they shouldn't be there, right? Like, they should be wiped out. Um, there's a, a company that Farshad and I are talking to where they've just launched their service, and they have, like, this eight-year-old system. I don't even know how they can have an eight-year-old system, considering the company's only been around for five years. Um, and it's like got this old version of Apache that hasn't been patched since 2014. It's like it seems impossible. Um, you'd think like brand new company, internet-based SASE type service, like how could you have this? And it, you know, that represents a potential vulnerability and weak, weak access to the system. Uh, another thing that we do with uh, um, uh, OSINT intelligence gathering, how many of you are familiar with DNS twist? All right, good. I can teach 90% of you something. DNS Twist is a service that you can use to look for uh, typo squatting and domain uh, stuff where, say, for example, your domain is cobalt.io, like ours is. You can look for misspellings and all these sorts of different things that fishers could be using to attack your environment. You can see which ones have mail servers registered with them. A common uh, mechanism that people will use is they'll, they'll register um, slightly altered things that are likely to be typoed. And the thing about that is they'll just they'll do a you know grab all mailbox there. So if somebody ever sends out a message with a, that type of domain, it automatically lands in their inbox and they've got your data, right? So a uh, couple things that we can do with the OSINT stuff. So um, really, as I just in summary, um, easy onboarding to our cloud. Uh, it's it's hours, not years, to kind of get going. Uh, shared platform, SecOps team, notification guidance, all that kind of fun stuff. So that's. Shift left, look right. Um, questions, comments, answers. Yes, Ed. Earlier you talked about MSP. Um, do, you, do you still consider yourself an MSSP? It's just that you're more sort of um, cognizant of how the actual uh, ecosystem has changed. Yeah, I think for a small customer, we kind of fit in that kind of bucket from what they think about. Um, I think the traditional model of MSSPs where they're coming in and they're managing your firewalls and they're you know, taking over your technology and all that kind of stuff is not our model. Our model is we're doing analytics and monitoring and all that kind of stuff. If so, I, I always get nervous about somebody wants to live operationally inside your environment. Like if we have 100 customers, how are we going to know any one of their environments well enough that you're going to trust them to make an operational change? Like there's a huge degree of risk with that. And so we're much more focused on uh, driving things through automation, right? Providing customers opportunities to, like, you know, if we see something, we give them a recommendation. It's like, you know, oh, we see that you've got a user whose credentials have been compromised on G Suite. You know, press this button to, you know, cause that user to do a reset password, that kind of thing, rather than going in and managing G Suite for them. That's, that's a rat hole that just doesn't make sense in a lot of cases for us. Um, but a lot of traditional MSSPs, the, the key difference for them is they take other people's technology and manage it. And we are, fundamentally, we are a technology company with a service component. And so we write our own code, we integrate technologies, we run, we're building an API gateway that allows us to do all this OAuth stuff that we talked about. Um, when you're buying a commercial SIM, you're, you live with whatever that product is until you're ready to deprecate it five years later. So that allows us to be more agile and nimble. Good question. Others? Yes? Uh, I'll start in the back. So in my environment, 
software help us? Yeah. Yeah, so what we're going to do is we're going to integrate event data from across all your different environments, your cloud, your uh, SaaS line of business, and all this kind of stuff, and we're going to watch it for signs of potential risk or attack. And then when we see something like that, we're going to give you a recommendation on what your team should do in response to it. That all the way back to my MacBook. All the way back to your MacBook, yeah. Yes? Um, I guess this is a question for Farshad. So, one of my concerns is, uh, like, if like, the developer is an open source library that compromised, or one of the libraries that's in our application currently gets compromised, and the next build they get pulled in and bundled and get shipped from production, um, what are the ways to protect against those kind of attacks? So, uh as, as you may have seen on the slide, the second uh, security, there were five different areas of security concern, right? So it was one source code analysis. The second one was dependency checking. So uh, there are tools, as I mentioned, like MergeBase, which is a local company that make a fantastic tool that we integrate with. There's uh, OWASP dependency check and a number of other things. But essentially the idea is that uh, by including that in your build, so essentially like maybe on your nightly build, it doesn't have to be on like every pull request. Ideally, it doesn't take a lot of time, so you may want to do it that way. I know uh, one of the clients that we're working with right now, they're making it the default, but they also give the developer the option to put a flag and skip it. But the, the idea is that when that runs, that will look at all the packages that you've included and all the dependencies and everything else, and it goes and checks it against a number of sources. So there are CVEs and stuff out in the field. So essentially the job of that tool is to go and look at everything and then find out that if there are known vulnerabilities with that particular package that you're including and alert you so that you don't go to release or you don't deploy that uh, without, having, without updating that. And that's quite important, uh, especially in, in this day and age because uh, developers want to be free to go and download all kinds of stuff, right? And then as we've seen in the last six months or in the last uh, few months, there was that one vulnerability where there was uh, one uh, open source uh, author, he retired and then he handed off his product or, or his project to someone else. The person that took over ended up putting some code that did crypto mining. And I think 600,000 people, it was a node package. And I think six, yeah, 600,000 people had downloaded it and they were all doing crypto mining for him, right? So if you were doing that kind of dependency checking on a regular basis, you'd be notified there was a zero day, this thing's vulnerable, get it out. now. Is that the be all and end all? No, but security is uh, all about doing as much as you can, you know, sort of a de defense in depth or a layered security model that you should be following. So by doing this, it's, it's uh, at least it, you've, you've taken some steps to, uh, to remove those packages as soon as uh, the, uh, you know, the, that there's a known vulnerability about them. Okay. I hope everyone can right? Sir? Uh, some of those dependency checkers can even patch the code on the file. Right, yeah. Sorry, the next question was here in the front. Yeah, oh, sorry. I've got a question from Farshad as well. So you talked about um, training developers and empowering them. Do you have thoughts around measuring whether you're making success, whether it's working or not? That's a really good point. I've tried that in a number in a, in a number of different organizations because how do you measure that, right? So you know, and there's different. So with developers, you want to see are they making the same mistakes over and over. So is that same problem keeps going to the testing team, com keeps coming back, and it's not resolved. Uh, uh, so. Uh, that's that's one aspect of it, or across your different teams, is that pro what are the most common problems and why they're occurring, right? So, I mean, the nice thing about OWASP top ten is that they've done that at the industry level. They're saying at the industry level, these are the top ten mistakes that are being made by the people that are building software. So you can assume that that's a good representation of the mistakes that would be made in your environment, and then you could focus on addressing those as low-hanging fruit. Now, in terms of having some metrics, one thing that I, I, that I rolled out at, at, at one of the companies that I was working with is essentially measuring that, right? So I made it the job of the team leads to say, okay, let's measure how many security defects we're finding, and then how many times that are, that are happening by the same developer. So is it that this person doesn't have the knowledge? If the same person is making the same mistake, let's make sure that the person gets the right training. So we introduce some of those KPIs to be able to, to measure those kinds of things. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. Yes, Eric. Oh, so. I'm going back to the previous question. Um, so that dependency scan, that's not source code analysis, that's just thread and top. That's different. Yeah, exactly. The dependency scanning is looking at uh, vulnerable packages out in the field, saying, "Hey, you're including this version of X Y Z. You know, you should update it because it's got this problem." Source code scanning is more about like you're you're, you're generating a digest. You're running a hash function. It's got a digest, and then you're doing a for loop to copy these byte by byte into a string. 
that's a bad thing because if you do that, you might end up with two hashes that are the same, right? That's a, that, so when you do source code scanning, is looking at the source code, how you've written things, are you doing things the right way, are you using the random function instead of secure random in Java, right? But the dependency checker is looking at a different layer of concern. Yes. Is it also checking the integrity of the dependencies, or is that like your package? Yes. Well. I mean, I can speak for RegBase, um, and to some extent we are, but um, the the packaging tools themselves are also supposed to check that initially when they download. But the problem is um, they're very cache. Um, they're addicted to caching, and so they don't recheck that later on. And so if the cache gets compromised, you could be in trouble. Our thing will catch if a method or a, has been added, so we will see that, that a malicious method has been added. Okay. Yes? Uh, question back to Mike. A lot of questions for the first time. Thinking forward, uh, let's say that you get 500 people on this platform and yep. constantly shoving data into your data center and, and you're looking through it in a variety of ways. There's a lot of shared learnings that could come out of all of that data coming in from a variety of people. So I guess my, my question is, what is the nature of the learnings that, you, that you're that you in the future hoping to lift out of that to shape some of the recommendations, strength and security programs of the individual participants? Right, so there, there's a couple obvious low-hanging fruits. The low-hanging fruits are things like developing use cases, right? So looking for specific stories that happen again and again and building detection capabilities for them. Another one that I'm really interested in, uh, being ex-vendor myself, is actually being able to measure vendor efficacy uh, based on how they're deployed across a whole bunch of customers. So if we have 500 customers and I can see, you know, 100 have got, for firewalls, like 100 have got uh, Meraki, 100 have got Fortigate, 100 have got Palo Alto, 100 have got these other vendors, I should be able to start to get some really interesting analytics on the effectiveness of different technologies as it compares to each other. But also, more generally, the effectiveness of certain controls and policies and, um, you know, from a high level, right? So. You know, this organization has got MFA, this organization doesn't. What is the comparative uh, difference between these different sorts of things? And part of our idea down the road is that we could then use that to drive recommendations around best practices back to customers. Part of the big challenge in the security industry is we have a lot of guidelines and policies and procedures that are fairly generic. Um, and what I mean by that is we'll have something like NIST or we'll have, um, you know, ISO 27001, 27002, all these sorts of big standards that have got, like, lots of different controls and policies and procedures that are important for different organizations. But the, the advice is all very generic. It's like, in general, you should do these things. And so that's true. In general, you should do those things. But more specifically, our hope is that by seeing what's going on in your environment, we can say, in specific, you should be doing these things because of what we're seeing. So an example is, we're seeing a bunch of brute force password attacks on your home page. You should be implementing some reCAPTCHA or some threshold timers or other things to reduce that risk. This is a better place for you to invest your time than, say, um, you know, turning on DLP because that's not something that's going to move the needle for your organization. So. Very much we're thinking about how we can take those recommendations and make them targeted based on seeing things across a cross-section of customers. But that's, you know, we've got to build the cross-section of customers first. <laughs> Still early stage. Thanks. Yep. Mark? So you're essentially expelling all this data from your customers into your cloud. <laughs> what, what's the data retention policy? Can that be set on a per-customer basis, taking into account that you need time to establish a baseline? And then can they expunge that? Should there be a legal requirement to do so? Yeah, so um, we're not operating in Europe yet, but we do expect to have those sort of expunged GDPR type capabilities. Um, generally speaking, uh, in, unless there's a specific compliance reason, we are not uh, retaining data for extensive periods of time because the security v value is relatively low after about 30 days. Um, so you know, we're still kind of defining what that's going to look like in the long run. But um, you know, we expect there to be a, a high degree of per customer requirement based on their compliance standards and, and other things like that. So if you're PCI, you've got to have a retention policy that allows for you know, to go back for 12 months. If you're just a regular organization, you don't have a particular standard, a shorter period of time may apply. So there will be flexibility on a per customer basis for that. Good question. Others? Excel dating. I mean, yeah. I have a question for Akasha. You talked about the mutable uh, servers. Yes. Uh, how does that fit in with your traditional and relational databases? Lots of data. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you have to have a data repository somewhere, right? So the the the, the immutable architecture talks about separating all that stuff. So in in like. 
some cases, right? You would have one host machine and then you would install your web server and then you would have, let's say your database server on the same machine. Hopefully you're not doing that. Hopefully you have the database somewhere else, right? And the idea is that by taking all your presentation layer and all those services and making sure that there's no data, there's no state, there's nothing that they're saving. There's not even any permanent storage, right? So you're not really, like traditionally, right? You'd have all these folders and you would store logs and you assume that that machine's gonna be there for a while. So you have a config files and all these things and you're really relying on local storage to be permanent. With the immutable architecture, you're saying, you know what? I'm assuming that this machine's not permanent. Therefore, I'm not gonna store any configuration or any data or anything that if this machine was gone would matter to me, right? So all that's Stuff gets moved somewhere else, and the question is, well, where does it go? Well, let's let's take a um, modern architecture. You've deployed something into the Amazon cloud. Your configuration should now sit within AWS, conf monitored by AWS Config. Your secrets should go into the you know the uh, the parameter store in the system manager. Your application workload should not contain any of that stuff. When the application starts up, it would go to that service for let's say the parameter store and fetch the parameters for configuring the database. Right now, what about the data itself? Well, the data itself, hopefully, you're not maintaining, you're not installing. A, uh, your own you know, uh, a Linux and installing SQL Server, the idea is that you would go uh, and use Amazon's managed services or Azure's managed services, and then they're handling all that data for you. And it's A, it's scalable, it provides um, you know, uh, essentially a lot of uh, other benefits as well. But if you did want to have your own and data systems, then that's an interesting thing because you can't, I mean, at, at the end of the day, data, that, that machine or that service that's hosting your data, that can't be immutable because you can't throw all that stuff out. But you could architect it, in, architect it in such a way that perhaps where the data is stored, that's what, where it matters. So maybe you use volumes like S3 volumes that you know, are going to be there. You don't have to throw those out. But then the Postgres server that's going to use that, the, uh, where, where it stores the data, that, is, that could be immutable, that you could just blow that up and then uh, you know, run it through your playbook. You could stand up a new Linux box with Postgres, uh, but then you know it would just always look for that S3 bucket wherever that data store may be, the, the, the attached volume. So now you've really uh, changed the problem, right? Now you've got, yeah, this attached, this volume is there that contains your data. That doesn't have to go away, but there's nothing to install on that data store, right? You can't, you know, that isn't a place where you can execute stuff. It's just a data store. The machine on which previously uh, attackers could install malware, that is the stuff that you're blowing up and then putting a new instance of up. Uh, on a regular basis. Yeah. I'd like to top up on that a little bit. Uh, how many of you, show of hands, are familiar with Amazon Spot Services? Yeah, uh, a third. Um, this is a great example of the you know the mutable, immutable kind of architecture. Is Amazon Spot Services for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a service where um, you can buy compute based on a, a price curve based on how much availability they have in their data center. Um, and the whole idea is you know you might have high compute activities that you need to do on a regular but not all the time basis like you know a batch job or something like that um, you have to be prepared for that system to be killed within two minutes at any given point in time so the data can't reside on that system I love it because it's a classic economics problem like how do you drive you know uh, you know the price demand curve and it's like great well we'll just change it so that you know if we've got excess capacity the price comes down if we've got not enough capacity the price goes up and you can literally tie your orchestration into this so it looks for the spot price based on the spot price falling below a certain level it fires up the job those expensive jobs are done you know during times when computers less expensive and so if you can do that kind of uh, mutable immutable architecture you can actually take benefits of these types of services and lower your cloud costs as well so um, yeah, most people I talk to who are running cloud infrastructure, they go, I'm not really too concerned about the security of my host because if something happens and I see it, I just wipe it, right? Like it's a totally different mindset than I've got the server I gotta protect, like wiping a server is a big deal. Um, you know, it's kind of the nuke and pave option. The, there is a challenge with that, which is I've nuked it, now I don't have any evidence. So you gotta make sure that evidence is getting off that system at all times. Yeah, it's really good point. Yeah. Uh, other questions? Uh, just a quick question to first up. Yeah. <laughs> on the uh, Eureka block diagram, it looked more like a reference design for on-premise. Uh, question to you, do you guys also integrate with like uh, hosted agents, uh, CI, CD, orchestration like Azure it, It's a Docker container. So as long as that Docker container, even if you have, it's uh, somewhere that is hosted, as long as you're able to run that Docker container inside somewhere, it should work, right? So the, uh, the only requirement is that it needs to have access to be able to mount 
uh, the, the repository, right? So essentially, there's the repositories provided as a folder or whatever. So, totally. Yeah. There are ways to add this customization a question more like, are you guys looking at that as like a... As a, out of the box? Yeah, exactly. It, it is it's definitely on the roadmap. So in the first few clients that we're working with, uh, they're following a model where their team city or their Jenkins is running within a host so that we have the option of running it in there. But we are working with others to be able to accommodate that model. Yeah. Maybe one more question from the back, and then we'll we'll break so everybody can like escape that needs to. We've got the room until one thirty, so feel free to, to mingle afterwards. Sorry, Mark. Yeah, I just wanted if you could speak a little bit more about the platforms that your platform supports and what the agent looks like it's consumption. Michael, Farsha, sorry, that's me. I assume. Yeah, um, so right now uh, our initial support is around AWS and uh, some corporate and SaaS services. So we're starting with things like G Suite and stuff like that. We add more sources kind of on a monthly basis. So we kind of come in and do a mapping exercise with the customer. Um, from a resources perspective, um, typically we're deploying similar to Farshad, a container that does collection and then forwards it into our cloud. So it's pretty lightweight. Um, and very easy to deploy. Like typical setup time for our customer in our uh, in our environment, per source is less than an hour. Um, when we have the the uh, API gateway, which is expected later this month, I mean, if you're familiar with any other integration workflow, it's the same idea, right? So, if you've plugged something into Slack where you go, you know, here's I'm choosing something from a menu, click, click, accept, accept. That's kind of the the workflow that we're driving for uh, SaaS applications. One of the great things that I love about how the industry has changed in the last five years is if you wanted to pull data out of security tools historically, it was syslog or nothing, right? Like, and usually the data wasn't very well formatted, and you know, there, there, the security vendors didn't like to share the data. It was like come to my platform and get and work within my platform. And more and more of them are releasing APIs that are both um, enabling you to get data as you need it. Um, but also increasingly allowing write APIs as well. So they can actually drive orchestration activity into um, a customer environment. And so the, the rising availability of these APIs, the adoption of cloud, all this kind of stuff, is driving for us an opportunity to do things differently compared to the legacy old school model, which is you know, buy a big piece of iron, buy a huge disk array, you know, store all the logs, do all the things. You know, we can do it more on a kind of cloud agile sort of way. So cost-wise, it's pretty, uh, you know, pretty cost competitive compared to the cost of doing it yourself, which is really the thing we're displacing for most customers is not, you know, you're buying a SIM. It's uh, somebody's looking at the logs on a manual basis and how do you get them out of that pain and into something that's more manageable. So I don't know if that really answered your question, but it was my best effort. So um, that's a break. And uh, feel free to come up and ask Farsh me questions directly. Thank you so much for coming out. Hopefully, you learned a couple things here. And uh, you know, we'll, uh, those of you who are interested, um, reach out to uh, Cobalt.io, follow, and we'll sign you up for future lunch and learns. We're doing these kind of monthly. We're all about education and learning, so we'd love to see you out. So thanks again. <laughs>